Hey, we are the Coalition Loud and Proud, Outrage Porn Free, and a day like today, feeling particularly civilly disobedient. I'm standing here at your state house, which until about, oh, about four or five hours ago could be loosely considered as the people's house. That is no longer the case, as the people were literally served an eviction notice from, if you will, the front approach, the front of the state house adjoining Smith Street, referred to as 82 Smith Street. Now, for folks who see this who aren't from the Rhode Island area, dozens of tents have been erected here uh, in an encampment for, for weeks. Unlike last year, where it was largely a political statement, a successful one, but a political statement, this particular encampment reflects folks who are in the, the throes of homelessness, started by an individual who, interestingly enough, took a pretty libertarian stance and still posts such at the front of the approach to the State House. Uh, he's been joined by, again, dozens of tents. The weather this winter, or I'll call it early winter, late fall, has been nothing short of horrific here. Uh, torrential rainstorms, freezing rain, which may have been both weather-wise and emotionally capped off just last week, when in a moment that could be best described as the official let them eat cake moment for the state of Rhode Island, a warm and cozy state house featured a governor lighting a beautiful Christmas tree with treats to be had and a special audience with Santa, the near to wells the hangers on, the coat hangers, the sycophants, the bloodsuckers, they were all here in force for their photo opportunity. Interestingly enough, most of Rhode Island wasn't, except for a very strong showing by homeless advocates who essentially shouted the governor down as he lit the Christmas tree. We've shared the video of that before. Today, uh, well, <laughs> in, a, in a day almost as horrific weather-wise, uh, the state decided to act. I'm with my good friend, someone I'm, I'm personally proud to uh, call a mentor, if you will, uh, a, an individual who's been a fabric of uh, independent media coverage of this hell spawn state government for years now and has really set a, a, a tone where, uh, where, where he's managed to achieve the perfect balance of honest reporting, on the spot, tireless reporting, mixed in with a, a little bit of a dose of advocacy in a manner that really, I think, redefines the new media. Of course, it's a long run-up. Steve Alquest is here. Steve, uh, you uh, you were here this morning. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was here around... I got here at, uh, shortly before 7 o'clock, like 6.30. Right. And it was um, quiet, but um, I parked. I'm watching this front of the state house because I had heard something was up. Um, so I was waiting. Then I saw the state police in the parking lot across the street, across Smith Street. And they were starting to like kind of build a little bit. So there was like six um, state police officers in their yellow um, rain slickers, and they crossed the street. They went into the state house. I got out of the car. I went over where the encampment, which is about um, 35 tents and maybe 50 people, although there were less people there last night, um, was just kind of waking up to start kind of coming to. I met with some people there. I walked around for a while. I could see through the windows that the police and some members of the governor's staff were having meetings down in the Capitol Police offices. So I was watching what was happening. I was waiting for something to happen. And then about an hour later, maybe 8 o'clock, 8.30, um, members of the governor's staff um, with the police, kind of the power behind them, came outside and started going tent to tent to issue eviction notices to all the people who are sleeping outside. I wasn't aware that it was the governor's staff's role to serve eviction notice. Is that part of the job description now in the state of Rhode Island? It's weird. In uh, Providence, when they want to evict an encampment somewhere, they send the police out, and usually there's a high-ranking officer and maybe a lower-ranking officer. They go tent by tent. Sometimes they call uh, one of the service providers, like uh, Crossroads or House of Hope, and they'll be there to kind of you know, minister to people's needs or to like you know to smooth things over but there but you know in general advocacy people don't want to be there serving eviction notices that's not their job but they are there to provide aftercare once something like that happens here so i was fully expecting it would be the state police taking the lead on this and doing the thing issuing the notices but it wasn't it was uh matt sheaf 
who is the senior communications advisor to the governor. Right. And Eva Marie Mancuso, who is special advisor to the governor. So I'm not sure what that means exactly. But special advisor is her title. There was another person there I didn't identify. He was a tall man. He had a pass, but I never quite got his name. And then there was somebody there who was from facilities, um, just there because he's the guy who's working at facilities. He didn't have anything to do with it per se. And he was bringing boxes around. They had cardboard boxes for people who wanted chose to leave to store all their stuff in. Now, mind you, these are cardboard moving boxes, which are fine if you're doing, talking about office supplies in a building. Not so great when it's raining out and right. you want to pack up a wet tent. But that's neither here nor there. They were there to give everybody a 48-hour notice that they would have to be out by 9 a.m. Friday morning. That's two days from now. Mm -hmm. So there was real, well, there was, was there any presence, and, and I get your point about members of the advocacy slash support community, mm -hmm. because very often those folks uh, can offer immediate emotional as well as personal, as well as some sort of structural support yeah. to those folks. Aftercare is a great word for it. Uh, after something that's probably gonna be very traumatic mm -hmm. to a number of people who, and again, I wanna stress that, and, 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 and Steve, you're a longtime Rhode Islander, I don't know. It, it, fortunately, it's only been cold a few nights, right. but I don't need, know if I've seen a protracted stretch of torrential rainstorms followed by cold, followed by torrential rainstorms. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's it's it, the, the conditions out here have been nothing short of nightmarish yeah. for people. You Yet, the, um, that's all they have. You mentioned the tree lighting. It was raining at the tree lighting, right? It was pouring rain. So when the people who were out here came inside to basically, you know, advocate to the governor strongly on a Christmas thing, hey, what about us? Um, they did that, they left their tents in the rain to come inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, today it's raining just as hard or, or worse. It's pretty bad up there right now. Right. And it's not only that, but I was there this morning and I, it was raining, so I'm using my camera, my video phone. And when I had to tweet, it was so cold because of the rain and the cold and the wind that I was literally having a hard time tweeting. I had to go to my car, turn on the car, warm up my hands so I could be warm enough mm -hmm. to tweet out the, the tweets and tell people what was going on because it was impossible otherwise. Now, the next challenge, of course, is whether or not these individuals choose to meet the deadline. Mm -hmm. what, what's your sense of that? Well, I, all right, so it goes all over the place. About eight to ten people already chose to take the government up on their offer. Now, and I want to talk about the offer a little bit before I get too far. Right. The offer was that they were going to have, they have your room, they have a room available at Emmanuel House, which is run by the Diocese of Providence. So Emmanuel House is a male-only shelter. So when I asked, what are we doing for women? I was told, we're working on that. This is at 9 a.m. this morning. When I asked, what are we doing for couples? They said, well, initially I think their idea was they were going to separate some couples. But then they went to a tent where there was an older couple. Um, the woman is in a wheelchair. The wheelchair is parked outside the tent in the rain, right? She, he helps her get around without, they can't put her right. in Warwick and him in Providence or him in Emmanuel House and her in another place because without him, that, he is her primary caregiver. It's, it's so, akin to separating a parent. So children. they needed to find another solution. So from what I hear, although I don't know this for sure, there were calls made because in the end, some of the couples were sent to hotels which we've been at, and so the advocates have been asking for hotel rooms for a while. It looks like when it push comes to shove, we all of a sudden got hotel rooms for at least the people out here. So as far as what people took, maybe eight to 10 people that I saw this morning, I had to leave for a couple hours, but eight to 10 people I saw this morning get into vehicles and be driven to new shelter. There are some people here though, who have decided that they want to stay. Um, one, for instance, one person, the person who started here was here starting in June or so, uh, Mike has said that he sees this as a political protest. You had mentioned Mike in your opening, right? Mm -hmm. He sees this as a political protest, that he could basically be in a tent anywhere, but he chooses to be in a tent here be, and he has his signs up. He sees this as political speech and, the, and he says, I don't think I should have to be forced to end my protest until I feel my protest is over, right? I mean, this is what protest mm -hmm. is. Protest isn't necessarily, okay, you have your five minutes to protest, now move on. Protest is whatever you think you need to do to make your, within the realm of peace, right? You don't, you, you know, you're not throwing rocks through windows, stand there all day and all night. As long as you, as long as you can fill or bust through your case, do so, right? If you fall con unconscious, 
wake back up, you keep your protest going. And, and Mike has been there for months, and to anyone yeah. who would talk to him, I, at some point, all of us are probably guilty of this, walking past a homeless person as oh, if yeah? they don't exist. If you actually engage with Mike, he would give you an extended, mm -hmm. emphasis on extended, <laughs> an extended reasonable protest point about virtually every aspect of government. Right. Uh, but, and, yeah. and so from him, from day one, this has been an intentional, right. thoroughly intentional political protest. Right. And he sees it in free speech, free assembly, and protest uh, terms. And I think there's a, a, a valid case to be made there. But here's the other thing. Everybody who's out there could have set up every anywhere. On the night, when you think about the Christmas tree lighting, they came inside to bring their complaint to the governor directly during the Christmas tree lighting. That was a direct protest. That was not a, um, that was not just, they, they could literally be, there's 80 plus encampments. So 25, 35 tents out here could be distributed. It wouldn't be, it would be one half of an extra tent at every encampment, right? It wouldn't even make a dent right. in the other encampments. But they chose to be here because they're trying to make a point. Mm -hmm. And what they want is that some, the people who took the housing today, the people who took the shelter, right? Just don't think of it as, oh, they took the shelter so they weren't serious about their initial point. Think about it this way. It is raining. I am cold. I've been sleeping in a tent, getting nowhere. And somebody says, here is a room, a hotel room, a warm place to stay. Of course you're going to take that, right? It's too mm -hmm. good a deal. And it's too much on your health. It's too much on your mental health, your physical health. But there are people out here who want to stay. And there are people out here who want to continue. And uh, we'll see what happens on Friday morning, how many people are still here, what the turnout from the community is, how people want to be here and tell the people, the governor or the police, hey, this is wrong. I don't know what's going to happen on Friday morning, but I know there's plans for a 5 o'clock Thursday night prayer vigil and for a 8 a.m. Friday morning something. And that's all I know right now. The advocates haven't told me more than this. Various groups are coming together and figuring this out. And so I mean, this all came on everybody very, very suddenly. And so they're trying to figure this out. Well, speaking of suddenly, do you get the sense from the governor's administration that this was a case of ready, shoot, aim? <laughs> yeah, um, I do, actually. I get the feeling like when they first went out there, they had Emanuel House. They knew they had some rooms at Emanuel House. I don't know that they understood that Emanuel House only takes men. Right. Um, if they did understand that, and maybe they were still working on getting a house for women, maybe that's the case. But also, I don't think they understood completely what it meant to be a couple out here. Right. I don't think they understood what it meant to be an LGBTQ couple. There were two young men out here who were sharing a tent, who were a couple, and they're trying to find a space that will take them together as a couple as well, right? Right. I mean, and there's a woman out here who could go to a shelter, but because she, her um, comfort animal, her uh, mental health animal is a mm -hmm. little tiny dog, snapped at somebody she was told she couldn't bring her dog into the shelter anymore well she can't place her dog anywhere else right if she doesn't have that dog that's bad for her mental health she said i would rather cut my arm off than lose my dog mm -hmm. and so she is choosing to live outdoors because mentally she doesn't want to give up her dog and i want to ask anybody who has a pet that they care about how willing are you to put your pet up for adoption because you happen to be homeless how right. much do you have to give up of your life you've already given up all your security, your possessions, so many things when you become homeless. What else do you have to give up? Do you have to give up your kids? Do you have to give up your partner? Your, you dignity. To, your dignity. Your dignity, your pets, your, the things that bring you any of the slightest amount of joy, you have to give all that up. Um, I also talked to a man who, I don't know if I said this before, but I'll say it again. Um, he has a full-time job. He's a cook. He works at nights. He has a full-time job every night. He's homeless right now. He does not have a house to sleep in. But he can't find a place to to sleep at a shelter because shelters say in by seven, out by seven. And he works till one o'clock in the morning right? or 11 o'clock at night. So he gets out and where does he go? He goes to the shelter and say, you can't come in, you're four hours late. He gets to bed around one. He wants to sleep till let's say 9 a.m. No, you have to be out by seven. Sorry, two, two hours early, you gotta be out. What does this guy do? What, how does he survive? And they're like, he's not gonna be homeless forever, mm -hmm. but he needs a place to sleep. What is going on with this guy? So there are 
a whole bunch of things. There's like a bunch of people who are providing services and living lives that don't fit easily into these boxes that a right. shelter bed says this is what it is. Right. Um, and we and the governor knew this was happening at least since last year. Mm -hmm. And hasn't done anything. This else. is this is not new. No. And with an average, I'll, I'll close off at this point with the average apartment basic apartment somewhere in the thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Plus security deposit, plus first month's rent. Right. Asking most of these people to somehow manage to pull together four to five thousand dollars cash on demand mm -hmm. is virtually impossible. It, it, it is an impossibility for many people. And and also remember that some people are dealing with like um, substance abuse and mental illness issues. Mm -hmm. And so even if they were possible, they might not have the wherewithal to make it possible. Right. Right. And so there's other, there are many compounding issues out here. And um, the reason I care is because it's people and people are messy and tough, but you know, we all need at least a baseline of certain things. Yeah. But there's a certain minimum, like that hierarchy of means. So let's wrap that up. <laughs> Steve Alquest, Uprise or I. He's everywhere and anywhere, when it, particularly when it comes to issues of conscience. Thanks. Uh, Steve, thanks again, and we'll, we'll see you out there, and we'll be broadcasting live at 2 o'clock. Yeah, definitely. We'll see you. God bless you. Yep.